Welcome to these two wonderful summer exhibitions. This is a great opportunity for you to see some of the wonderful pieces we have in our permanent collection. Um, we've resumed a long time tradition of pulling pieces out of our collections for the summer months for people to enjoy. So you can see re recent acquisitions and then pieces that haven't been on view in a very, very long time. And some, I'm not even sure if they've ever been on view. So I want to congratulate Caitlin Clay, our curator of exhibitions, because she did a fantastic job on this exhibition. The pairings of these pieces are so clever and so well done, and you really have to have a curator's eye. You really have to think about how these pieces have relationships to each other as you go around the gallery. So just make sure it's one that really you should visit more than once. It's one that you want to come back and see over and over again because you're going to catch assimilations, differences, and uh, similarities uh, as you look at the pieces over and over again and become more familiar with them. And of course, an exhibition like this wouldn't be possible without funding from, from our sponsors. Um, and we are funded in part by the Texas Commission on the Arts the National Endowment for the Arts, the Wesley W. Washburn MD and Lulu Smith MD Endowment Fund, the C. Homer and Edith Fuller Chambers Charitable Foundation, the City of Beaumont, the members of the Art Museum of Southeast Texas. To find out more about how the National Endowment for the Arts um, grants impact individuals and communities, visit www.arts.gov. And also just want to put a plug in if you're not a member of the museum, which I, I think most of you are, I'm looking around the room and I see that just probably about 95% of you are members. But consider becoming a member tonight. Um, memberships start at $25 for seniors, educators, and students. $50 for an individual membership, $100. To, and if you become a $100 member, you get a reciprocal membership which gets you in free to other museums, other art museums around, and other museums in general, around uh, the United States. And if you join at the $250 level, you get another reciprocal membership, which gets you even to even more museums. So I can really save you a lot of money, especially if you like museums and you like to travel. You'll more than make up your $100. So consider that. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin. Caitlin Clay, our curator of exhibitions. Thank you, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out for tonight's opening reception. Now, to start off, I'd like to talk a little bit about myself. Normally, I have the honor or the privilege to introduce who our speakers are. Typically, it's the artist showing in this space, and we have an essayist who wrote the essay. But I curated these shows, and I wrote the essays. So I actually grew up here in Beaumont. Um, I'm a Beaumont native, and I went to school here through high school, left for a little while to go to college. But when I was little, my mom would actually bring my four siblings and I to this art museum. Um, it's been the Beaumont Art Museum and since the 1950s, and then in the 1980s when we moved to this particular location, we changed our name to the Art Museum of Southeast Texas. And so I actually have photographs of myself at five making artworks in our classroom, which is just so very cool to have that. And now be a person who is helping create those memories for our younger community members. Now, a little bit more about these two exhibitions. Uh, these are both permanent collection exhibitions. This one we're standing in is called Conversations and Connections. And the one behind us is called Summer Days, Selections from the Permanent Collection. Now, what is a permanent collection? A permanent collection is a, a group of artworks that are typically owned by an institution. So everything that's on display is owned by the art museum here. Now, our permanent collection numbers over 1,700 objects. That's a lot of objects. And the majority of them are typically in storage because we are showing artists from out of town, uh, we show artists from all over the state of Texas, as well as Louisiana. We show folk artists, particularly Mexican folk art. And before COVID, we actually had a long tradition of spending the summer exhibiting our permanent collection. Now, due to COVID, we had to push back a lot of our exhibitions 
with some of our out-of-town artists, which really changed up our schedule. And it's just this summer that we get to return to these summer permanent collection exhibitions. So I'm so excited that we get to bring out the permanent collection, because it's not often that people get to see a wide majority of these pieces. So when I was coming up with these two shows, I wanted something where I could show a wide variety of the permanent collection. Our permanent collection consists primarily of artwork from Texas contemporary artists, so artists who are living today, um, as well as some early Texas art that's very hard to come by. So if anyone has some, you let us know. And then uh, we also have American folk art, Mexican folk art, and then a sort of a variety of objects that were given to us when we first were established as an institution that don't get to be shown as often because they don't really fit who we exhibit and collect from anymore. Now, because those objects are still part of the permanent collection, I thought, what a wonderful opportunity to pair objects of artists that we are collecting now with objects that are from the founding of this institution. So if you look at our labels, you will see a little number down at the bottom. It says PC, and that'll have a year and a period and then another number after that. That first number is the year that that artwork was given to this institution. So you'll see artworks going all the way back to even like the 1970s, the 1960s, all the way up to our newest um, acquisitions, which include this beautiful James Watkins double wall black cauldron, as well as behind your own, that gorgeous gold ceramic piece, also by James Watkins. And then behind this column, you'll have to go see it, is a fantastic Mexican folk art sculpture of uh, alabrije, which is a hybrid animal. And we just purchased those in the last year. So they're very brand new. Now this exhibition we're standing in, Conversations and Connections, it's about connecting the dots. It's sort of how does a curator or an art historian think when they're putting artworks out on display? So we have some different pairings and groupings, and I encourage you to think about these pairings and groupings in relation to one another on many different levels. This includes the elements of art, the principles of art and design, as well as biographies. So I encourage you to look up the artists and find out more about their biographies, as well as just, you know, the subject matter, the composition. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about bit about some of these pairings and groupings, but like Lynn said, if you could come back, spend some time in this space, you're going to find even more connections. I'm finding even more connections, and it's super exciting. So the first grouping I'm going to talk about is sort of here, off to my right, maybe your back left. And here we're going to start with this first really large piece that you see. This is called Send Us Your Poor. It is by the artist Paul Manus. Paul grew up here in Southeast Texas. He went to school at Lamar. And he's known for these very large canvases. Um, another one you'd be familiar with is the airplane painting. That's about 20 feet up in a lobby. That's also by Paul. And what I really loved about this piece is the size as well as um, the stars and the symbolism that relates back to uh, the history of America and how that relates to our conversations about immigration and the history of our country today. So Send Us Your Poor uh, really speaks to, you know, America being a, a country for immigrants, for people to come to, to realize their dreams and their freedoms. And I've put that rather near this Josiah Wedgwood piece. Now, Josiah Wedgwood was an English artist, and what's interesting is this piece is titled America, and it's very much sort of an allegory of what we think America should be. She's female, she has stars, she has a star on her crown, she has a flag that she's holding, there's a shield, and she has the laurel wreath in her hand, which when we think back to sort of Greek uh, and Roman times, the laurel wreath was a symbol of victory. And so we have this crossover between symbols. We have the stars. We have the circle of the wreath, as well as the circle here in Paul's piece, as well as this sort of 
romanticism of how we understand the country of America and how we depict it. And if we keep moving, we have a video. It's by the artist Prince Thomas. Now, Prince is from Houston, but he teaches here at Lamar, which is really interesting having it near Paul's piece, since Paul is also from this area. Now, Paul is a white male artist, and Prince is of Indian heritage. Prince put together this video, and he titled it America the Beautiful. And in the video, you'll see three opera singers singing patriotic songs. Now, during their songs, they'll be interrupted by voiceovers. And in these voiceovers, people are, one of my voiceover actors is here, Dennis Keel. In this voiceover, Prince has different uh, voice actors reading comments that were actually written on different social media platforms, like maybe CNN posted a video or something, that relate to sort of racist ideology of people who have immigrated or have a different heritage other than white in this country. And what's interesting is that each of our opera singers is non-white, they're a person of color. So we have a black woman, we have a man of maybe Latino or Hispanic heritage, and then we have um, a woman of Asian heritage as well. And it's a very moving piece because it's very difficult to see these people singing so beautifully, these patriotic songs, and to be interrupted by such hate hateful vitriol, right? And then to have it near a piece that says, send us your poor, please be invited to come and as we keep moving, we come to Charles Kreiner's An Obama Mama. And she is so happy. She makes me smile every time I look at this piece. She is so excited. I like to think she's celebrating the election of Obama for the first time as president. And we've got this beautiful quilt behind her. Kind of reminds me of the Guy Bend quilters who are from the Deep South, who are very uh, well known for their abstract quilts. And then we see these stars that she seems to maybe be catching or throwing into the sky. And that kind of connects back to this Paul Manus piece we saw when we first walked in, right? And as we keep kind of moving around, I didn't want these groupings to just be sort of one-off spaces. I want you to feel like you can move in sort of a circular manner through this space. And so I put here, next to the crime of peace, Robert Rauschenberg's um, untitled lithograph. And we see here these Greek busts who are sort of included, as well as this profile, um, which alludes very nicely to our Charles Kreiner here, as well as going back to our Wedgwood piece up at the front. <laughs> but that's not all. If we keep moving, we see this Robert Madden, and Robert is also a local artist. He taught at Lamar for a very long time. Rauschenberg, if you took your first art history preaching class, you'll know he's from the Port Arthur area and made his way to New York. But you have this correlation and sort of composition, right, which is really interesting. But you also have two white male artists who are from this community. Robert Rauschenberg, who went on to become a very famous artist, you know, he's in every art history book. And then Robert Madden, who is so well-known and well-loved here in our community and was a professor for a very long time to many of our current artists and community members. And so there's this comparison, right, of biographies, of composition, of meaning. And I could just, I could keep going up because I'm very happy with this show. <laughs> Um, but if we're going to keep moving, we've got one of our new acquisitions again, this James Watkins bottle form. Uh, James is an African-American artist from Lubbock, and we just had a show with him this past winter. If you missed it, we've got some great photographs. But this is a, a fantastic piece, and James creates these double-walled cauldrons. So there's two walls, and it's actually hollow in between. 
and that allows them to really build up these very large pieces. And what's neat is that they're sprayed with sort of stannous chloride, and they're treated in a manner that you have this permanent iridescence on the surface. He also will tape off the surface, so you get this kind of linear design on the top. And so I liked how we have the reference to the circles again, the linear motion that you see in the Robert Madden, and then someone had told me when they first saw this piece that the iridescence reminded them of the sheen of oil on water. And so that's why it's not necessarily paired, it's kind of a piece to you know, bridge two groupings with this Julie Speed, the oil baron, and Alexander Hogue, Spindletop 1901. Now, Alexander was known for his pieces about sort of the Great Depression and about nature. And what's interesting about this piece is that he always kind of felt that humankind was uh, responsible for the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, and it's sort of our fault for not taking better care of nature. But then you have this piece, and it kind of seems celebratory, right? Spindle top. And I was looking up why he made this piece, and it was actually a commission from Life magazine to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Spindle Top oil fields. So it was never actually printed in the magazine, but it was created as part of the suite of images to be used to celebrate Spindle Top. So we have this celebratory nature of the oil industry, how it began, began in this area, right? And then we have Julie Speeds, the oil baron. And Julie Speed lives in Marfa. Um, she considers her work, or historians consider her work as sort of new surrealism. So if you're familiar with surrealism, it's artwork that kind of is reminiscent of what you dream about. And the unconscious is often um, integrated into that art making. And so Julie will take uh, collage images from the 19th century and she'll draw on them, she'll add color. And what's interesting is that she's added this oil derrick to this man's head, and she's also included a third eye, as if maybe he can see the future, maybe he sees that oil in that ground, and what it's going to do for all of them in the future. And she's titled a uh, Phelps Montgomery down on the bottom. So I think one of them really leave you with a sense of, oh, this is really great, or oh, this is really bad. There's just sort of two different perspectives of looking at it, right? But if you keep circling, you'll come across our Vernon Fisher in separation, which includes these almost punched out letters. And if you read through it, you'll actually see a story about a man, sort of his mourning. And at this time, Vernon was going through a separation with his wife, so he um, wasn't in the best mental state. So it's a very interesting sort of look into his life, but also using text as an element of your art making. That's paired with this Dan Busy, which is written, I won't make any more art lines, and he just keeps repeating it, he smudged some of it, he's erased some of it, and by writing that over and over and over, he has actually created something that is art. And so we have these comparisons of two pieces using text, which I really love pieces using text, I find them very interesting. Behind the column, we have our new acquisition of the alabrije. So again, alabrije is a hybrid animal. It is typically made of copal wood. This one's made of cedar. So if I take that lid, lidded box off, you can actually smell it. It smells really good. But it's created by an artist couple, Jacobo and Maria Angeles. And the Angeles couple, they work together as a team. So Jacobo will actually go cut down the wood. He will carve it into the shape. And then Maria will take a teeny tiny little paintbrush and she'll paint these little designs on it. And each of the designs symbols something about sort of Mexican culture. Maybe this symbolizes the people or this symbolizes the food. And so it's a very beautiful, artistic, um, time-consuming piece. And also he's got gold and silver plating on him. He's 
beautiful, with a little eagle foot. As we come to the center of the room, we have Carol Appel's uh, innocent cat. Innocent cat. There are 12 cats in the collection. Every one of them is different. They have funny names. Um, there's frightened cat and smiling cat. And I just love these cats. I think they're so cute. And I love the purple background on this one because it pairs so well with this folk art piece. And what's very cool in my mind about these two pieces that Carol and um, Freddie were from two totally different countries. And they were two totally different artists. So Freddie was a folk artist, which means typically he didn't have any kind of professional art education. And then um, Carol actually was a part of the Cobra art movement, which was started in um, the Netherlands and really became popular in Denmark, and it was very well known for its influences of uh, being influenced by like childish art. But we often equate folk art with sort of a childish or naive practice as well. And so you can compare these two um, compositionally through color, and I think they're really fun being next to each other. And as we keep moving, we come to uh, Beth Ames Swartz, and then there's a Michael Tracy on this side. And um, Beth's bio is really interesting. She created this piece by traveling to Jerusalem in the 1980s. And she chose 10 locations where historically uh, Israeli women from the Bible have had moments of victory or achievement. And in those 10 places, she created artworks. And what she did is she would take this paper, and she would paint it, and she would burn it, and she would bury it. And if you read the label on the back, it actually says it's made with fire, and with air, and with color. And then she would kind of dig up the paper, and she would display it in a frame, um, like this one. And um, it has this beautiful, uh, iridescence on it again, but I also just love the process of how it was made. And Beth is very spiritual. Her art is about religion and spiritual experience. And the Michael Tracy on the back is sort of made in a similar manner. So Michael Tracy uh, was raised Catholic, and a lot of his artwork is about the religious experience. So this piece that's on the back side of this column is actually titled Altar. And so we have a spiritual piece made by a female artist, and we have a spiritual piece made by a male artist, and they're standing in juxtaposition to one another, which I think is really great. We're going to talk about our last grouping here, and um, it sort of begins with there's a jewelry piece in the far corner, and it's actually made out of interwoven hair. And if any of you are familiar with the history of jewelry, which I was not, um, but I went to the McFadden Ward presentation on jewelry, and this is where I learned about that piece. Um, so pieces made with interwoven hair were often made in memory of someone. Maybe they had passed away, or maybe it was just, you know, they were moving or something, and so the piece was made in memory of them. And I've put it next to a Mimi Dubois painting. Mimi is also from our area. And um, that piece is titled The Bereaved. So I like to think that maybe she's thinking about a loved one. And maybe that jewelry could have been a piece of hers to think about someone she loved. And next to it on the left, we have an Ellen Tanner. And the title of that piece is Persephone and Hades. And if you're familiar with your mythology stories, um, Persephone was the daughter of Demeter. And so she was a spring goddess. She helped bring the spring. And Hades, who was the god of the underworld, actually fell in love with her. She didn't love him. So he stole her away to the underworld and tricked her into having to stay down there so many months a year. And so the story of Persephone and Hades is a story about the changing of the seasons. And in this painting, we don't really know, is he stealing her for the first time? Is he pulling her back down? Is she, you know, with her hand outstretched, trying to get away? 
and um, it's placed next to a Winslow Homer titled St. Valentine's Day. And we see two lovers in the middle, and they are reading about love stories. And around the perimeter of them, we see historical and legendary couples uh, who are portrayed from many different cultures and countries. And so there's a story of maybe like a young couple in the beginning of their love, and we're putting it next to a story of a woman who was sort of forced into love, right? Um, and when we think about like contemporary retellings of Persephone's story, sometimes she does fall in love with Hades. So there's um, this comparison of how we tell stories about love and myth and passion. And then we come to this purple piece, which was in my office. So this is a Rachel Hecker. And Rachel has depicted two female bodies, and then we have sort of a cartoon male figure. But when you look at the work more closely, you can see it, it says the word fright down below. So is he scared? Is he excited? Does he desire them? It's left to some ambiguity on how you interpret it. But this question of desire works well with are two pieces to the right. I also put close to it the ceramic piece by Moises Rodriguez. Now Moises is a Mexican folk artist, and um, he's depicted the story of the Lapiths and the centaurs. So I had to look this one up, y'all. The, the Lapiths were a group of people. They were having a wedding. Uh, he has particularly depicted the women. And the centaurs decided they would disrupt this wedding by uh, making off with the women was the plan. Historically, though, the Latins were victorious and they got away from the centaurs. So the centaurs were foiled. And, you know, we have Persephone, who was unable to get away. We have these, this couple that's in love. And then we have these two women who may or may not be ogled by this man, or who might also be afraid of them, combined with this ceramic sculpture of um, women and their people being able to triumph over uh, a potential kidnapping, so to speak. And so there's these different tellings of, uh, of passion and lust, and how that's told through mythology, and also how it's understood contemporarily. So these last two, we have the Charlotte Smith on the right, which is the blue one, and then um, Mary Ballmeister on the left. This beautiful, abstracted piece on the right that was sort of obsessively created by dripping acrylic dots on top of each other. Can you imagine the amount of time that would take? And then it's here next to Mary's piece, which also includes teeny tiny little buttons and shells. That's actual sand on the surface that has been manipulated to look like that honeycomb shape. And I really liked those two next to each other because uh, the surfaces were very similar to one another. There's also that obsessive nature to, to making something um, that's actually both very delicate they're both very delicate surfaces. And then with Mary's piece on the left, sort of bringing us back to Paul's piece in terms of the color palette that was used. So I hope you'll take a chance to walk around the exhibition, sort of think about some of the things I mentioned, make your own connections between these pieces. Our Khan Education Gallery has art activities for the young at heart and our young ones, where you can do a few hands-on activities. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna let you go so you can enjoy the exhibitions and have a wonderful night.